President Douglas dialogues. It's great to see all you guys, especially new faces. So I'm going to run down on the uh, format of the event. So first, we're going to have Zach Lynn talk about the mission of the club and what we're what we do here. And then Professor DiMaggio is going to introduce Professor Tomsky. And then uh, me and Declan have a couple of broad questions for Noam Tomsky just to cover some ground on the topics today. And then we're going to open it up to audience q &A. And um, I just want to give a special thank you to the Ethics Center for co-sponsoring this event, specifically uh, Jessica Jackson and Dr. Michael Pismato. I also want to give a sincere thank you to Dr. Anthony DiMaggio for uh, making this engagement possible. And I encourage you all to keep up with his important and um, growing scholarship on neo-fascism in the United States. So I'm going to pass over to Declan to talk about the club. Hello, everyone. My name is Declan. I'm the Vice President of the Douglas Dialogues. I'm going to explain the mission of our club, and then Rehan, um, like you said, will do the other Q&A. Um, so the Douglas Dialogues aims to create a space for students of all political and philosophical backgrounds to, to discuss what they find to be the uh, pressing sociocultural and political issues of the day. We advocate for and believe that open and honest dialogue regarding different approaches and interpretations of these issues is the best way forward in making the world a better place. Our club is open to any Lehigh student our members aren't pre-selected by their political beliefs and majors, but only by their interests and curiosity in the affairs of the world. We meet bi-weekly to discuss topics our club members democratically decide to talk about. We've talked about topics from anti, uh, combating anti-intellectualism, the consequences of social media, to white supremacy, and global elections. If you'd like to keep up with the discussions, just approach me after the event or email Rehan on, at RAA223. 523. <laughs> This is messed up, that's my bad. Uh, another big focus of this club is to invite speakers who are ex experts on topics we find to be pressing and may not know much about. We wanna create a place where students can listen to and are able to contend with those very ideas academics have worked on. Today, we have our 13th speaker event so far. Um, and with uh, Professor Chomsky, this will be our 20th unique speaker we've had at the Douglas Dialogues. Gonna give it up to Professor DiMaggio for the introduction. Hi, I'm Anthony DiMaggio. I'm a state professor in uh, for the science department here at Lehigh University. I just want to thank everybody today. I have uh, corresponded with Noam Chomsky for about the last decade and a half. We have this sort of similar interests, it turns out. Uh, media and politics, study of social movements, um, propaganda, right-wing extremism. And so uh, this was, I thought, a good opportunity. Uh, Reverend Rehan approached me about this to try and get uh, an important speaker who's I think one of the most important intellectuals alive today. Um, he has an incredible record as a critical scholar, as an intellectual, as an activist for democracy. Uh, I want to extend him a warm welcome uh, from Lehigh University for taking this time to be with us. We really appreciate it. And um, you know, his, his talking with the Lehigh community, right? Um, so we're gonna be focusing on some really important issues today related to US foreign policy, uh, domestic policy, right-wing extremism. Uh, and so without further delay, you didn't come here to see me talk, right? <laughs> I wanna hand this over to, to Rehan and thank the Douglas Dialogues and everyone involved for putting this on. And we're gonna get started. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're going to get started. So my first question is about um, political extremism. So Professor DiMaggio, there's been a rise in far-right political sentiment and extremism in our country, from the mainstream of great replacement theory on cable news television, the January 6th insurrection, the list goes on and on. Uh, my question is, what do you attribute to be the cause of such an influx in far-right political sentiment and extremism in our country today? Do you view Trump to be a cause or a symptom of this sentiment? First of all, it's not... <clears throat> It's not just in the United States, it's a worldwide phenomenon with variations in different countries. You could see it uh, very clearly, for example, at the uh, conference in Dallas a couple months ago by the Conservative Political Action Caucus, that's a large part of the core of the Republican Party, their keynote speaker was Viktor Orban, the, uh, who's one of their heroes, especially a great hero for uh, uh, their, Tucker Carlson wrote a documentary about him, great hero for of Trump and others. He's been, he's turned Hungary into what is called an illiberal democracy. That is 
not a democracy, an autocracy, a racist, xenophobic, uh, uh, autocratic system run from the top, uh, pretty much killed independent media throughout the only independent university, uh, undermined uh, intellectual freedom and uh, a perfect match for the Republican, today's Republican Party. In fact, to a couple months earlier, before the Dallas conference, uh, Orban had a ran an international conference of uh, right-wing uh, racist reactionary neo groups in Europe with neo-fascist origins. Uh, the star uh, uh, gr a group that attended was the Conservative Political Action Caucus. President Trump gave a speech. Tucker Carlson gave a laudatory address uh, they fit right in so it's not a it's not just the united states it's a broad growth of uh, far-right organization uh, far-right groups political parties uh le pen and uh in france uh, alternative for deutschland and germany uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, right now the far right uh, religious nationalist government in Israel is another example. There are many all over the uh, Neil Farage in England and others. So very broad. Uh, each region area has its own reasons. So, but there are a few uniformities, general features of what's happening, I think. Uh, one of them is the fact that for the last roughly 45, 40, 45 years, the world has been subjected to a bitter, savage class war. It's called neoliberalism. If you look at the official definition, it's supposed to have something to do with more free markets has almost nothing to do with free markets. Uh, you wanna know how much it has to do with free markets? Take a look at what's happening right today in the banking crisis. Bank collapses, federal deposit insurance corporation uh, 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 guarantees uh, deposits up to $250,000. But it turns out there's a lot of rich people who had deposits much higher than than that. So they have to all be bailed out by you, by the taxpayer. That's routine ever since Reagan, when he opened the floodgates. Uh, 1950s, 1960s, no bank crises. The Federal Reserve, the uh, Treasury Department monitored banks. They were regulated. They were banks. They had functioned as part of the general economy. He had a little extra money, he put it in the bank, somebody else came and borrowed it to buy a car or something like that. Reagan changed all that, uh, opened the doors in many ways. Reagan in the United States, Thatcher in England, uh, introduced what's called neoliberalism. It's, as I say, it's basically class war, opened the doors for uh, sheer uh, robbery of the general public. It's had a lot of effects. Take the United States where it's well studied. Uh, the Rand Corporation, highly, re highly regarded uh, quasi-governmental corporation, uh, did a study about a year ago of what they call the transfer of wealth from the from working people and the middle class lower 90% in income, transfer of wealth from them to the top 1% in the past 40 years. That figure is roughly $50 trillion. That's pretty impressive class war. Highway robbery on a massive scale has many effects. You go back to the 1970s, the US was more or less in the range of 
other developed societies by most measures. Uh, inequality, uh, um, medical costs, uh, incarceration, uh, a lot of other measures towards the high end, but not way out of the spectrum. Now it's just off the spectrum. It doesn't, doesn't even fall within the spectrum of, uh, uh, of uh, Western societies, which still have retained some of the uh, social support systems that have been almost totally eradicated during the rather extreme version of savage class war that's been carried out here. Uh, well, has many effects. One effect is it leaves a large part, a large part of the population, actually majority of the working population, uh, living under the real male wages have not risen since uh, the late seventies. Non-supervisory male workers has been an increase in productivity, of course, but it's gone into very few pockets. Uh, Social benefits have stagnated. Unions, the main way in which people can defend themselves in class war, have been decimated here and in England. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's left people, large, probably a majority of working class, uh, basically living from paycheck to paycheck, many with very precarious employment. Uh, new precariat, it's called. Uh, you don't know if you're going to be called to work tomorrow or not. And maybe if you are, you work uh, double double hours. There's large, w w simple wage theft, billions of dollars of years stolen. Uh, and uh, the right wing and Republican Party refuses to allow even investigation of it. Uh, it's a straight, vicious class war. Uh, left people angry, rightly resentful, uh, distrustful of institutions for perfectly good reasons. It's perfect terrain for a demagogue, somebody who can come along and with one hand hold up a banner saying, I love you, and with the other hand stab you in the back. Trump, in other words. Many of these, many of his, uh, his counterparts elsewhere. You know, take a look at the uh, Trump uh, administration uh, legislative achievements. Basically, one uh, 2017 tax cut. Uh, economist Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel laureate, called it the Donor Relief Act of 2017. It's a tax cut for the very rich and the corporate sector, which means everybody else picks up the tab. Uh, it's dressed up in various ways. Take a look at the current Republican legislative programs. One of the highest on the agenda is to defund the Internal Revenue Service. Why? What does the Internal Revenue Service do? Goes after tax cheats. Who are the tax cheats? Some working class guy who uh, pays his taxes? No, they're not the tax cheats. Tax cheats are the very rich who have a battery of corporate lawyers to uh, make sure they can find tricky ways to avoid taxes. Uh, so you got to cut down inspection of them. That's the top priority for the GOP. It's, um, this is the first time in over a century that billionaires have paid lower uh, taxes uh, than um, some worker in a steel plant. It's never happened before, not for over a century. Well, these are, Similar things have happened all over the world. Many places, it's much worse than here. So poor, poor countries, who were the main victims usually, they've been subjected to uh, what are called structural adjustment programs, which demand that they cut back 
social services uh, privatized and assets over the rich foreign investors uh, in the similar programs called the Washington Consensus. And slid in Latin America, it led to two decades of virtually no development, barely beginning to pull out of it. Other countries that had much more lethal effects. Uh, so in Yugoslavia and Rwanda in the 1980s, these policies simply tore the countries apart. Well, that laid the basis for ethnic tensions and conflicts, which led to the horrors of the early 1990s. In one way or another, it's been going on all over the world, over most of the world. Uh, and it has the kinds of effects I mentioned. Uh, so I think that's one core basis for the rise of the far right, angry, uh, Americans with uh, and elsewhere who are subject to all the things. You want to look for some kind of explanation for your plight. I'm not doing anything wrong. So what's happening? Well, it must be the uh, uh, Democrats who uh, are carrying out a great replacement to eliminate the white race. Uh, or maybe the Democrats are run by <clears throat> uh, uh, sadistic pedophiles who are grooming children. Almost half of Republicans believe that. Uh, one or another story, you look for something. That's how the fascist movements developed in the past. We're watching it here right in front of us. There are similar things happening in other countries, one way or another, different, different elements in different countries. It's very striking in the rural world here. I don't know how many of you come from rural communities, but uh, go to a normal rural community in the United States. Uh, young people are leaving the industrial part of the basis for the economy has been killed by Clinton's uh, deindustrialization policies. They're called free trade. They had nothing to do with free trade policies for setting working people around the world in competition with one another with enormous rights for investors, uh, massive protectionism, radically opposed to free trade. That's why drugs are out of sight here. A patent regime which never existed in the past, nothing remotely like it. Uh, Go to the town, the industry's left, young people are leaving, the banks are boarded up, uh, uh, nothing left. Uh, the, what happens is you, it even leads to a phenomenon that's never happened before, increase in mortality. Doesn't happen in countries aside from war, pestilence, last couple of years. Mortality has increased in the United States, in the white working class, people 25 to 50, they've just given up, well, deaths of despair by economists. That's very effective class war, and it's left a situation in people where people are open to uh, the uh, performances of Trump-style demagogues to uh, Marjorie Green uh, type uh, fantasies, uh, whatever people hear in there from the pastors in a mega church, uh, all of these things are happening. There's a background, it's not, it's not new, it's not out of nowhere, but it's extended enormously in the last 40 years of savage class war. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. Um, I'm going to ask a question with regards to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Is the potential peace, peace gained from negotiations worth allowing Russia and Putin to escape the consequences of their war crimes? That's the nature of diplomacy. Diplomacy means 
by definition. It's something where neither side gets what they want, but each side gets enough so that it can live with it. That's called diplomacy, often works. Uh, it's never very just, but the alternative to diploma diplomacy is keep fighting. That's the alternative to diplomacy. That's just logic. Well, what happens if you keep fighting? One of two things, either one side or the other capitulates or it just goes on in a stalemate, which wears down, destroys both sides, like what was happening during the First World War. Those are the choices. Now it would be nice to live in a different universe run by peace, justice, uh, Mahatma Gandhi and so on. But we happen to live in this universe. In this universe, take Iraq, take Ukraine, take what you want. Either there's a negotiated diplomatic settlement or there isn't. If there isn't, the choices are between stalemate, continue to grind each other down, or one side capitulates. It's very likely that, unlikely that Russia will capitulate. Remember that they have ultimate weapons. If they're ever beginning to face defeat, no sign of that. But if there ever is such a situation, it's very unlikely that Putin is going to quietly pack his bags and go home into uh, oblivion or worse. They can always move up the escalation ladder. So the chances that they'll capitulate are slight. So the real alternatives are diplomacy, which by, by definition won't be perfect, and uh, or else just continuing the war until Ukraine is totally destroyed. And maybe it moves up the escalation ladder to nuclear war. Uh, it's kind of interesting, just a final comment, that this question is raised. You should ask yourself, why is the question raised suddenly? Has it ever been raised before? When the United States invaded Iraq, the worst crime of this century, did anybody ask whether uh, the aggressors should be punished? I don't recall that. Actually, there was an interview with uh, George W. Bush, the main, uh, the main uh, perpetrator of the crime. Uh, the interview was in the, there was one interview that I found, it was in the Washington Post in the style section. It was a report of uh, an interview with this, as they called him, goofy grandpa who was playing with his children, showing grandchildren, showing off the portraits that he'd painted. Not many comments. None that I saw except for those who find him quite adorable, like Michelle Obama, who said, I just love this man. He's funny. He's a wonderful person. Uh, well, that's the way the perpetrators are heated, treated here. Uh, we can go through the list. Dick Cheney, Henry Kissinger, long list of bloody atrocities. We're coming up to, right now, to what's called what we ought to call, we don't, we ought to call the first 9-11, 9-11-1973. Talk about that in the United States or the West, nobody knows what you're talking about. Talk about it in Latin America, they know exactly what you're talking about. 9-11-1973 was the US implemented military coup that overthrew uh, Chilean democracy and installed a vicious, brutal dictatorship. Well, we might compare the two 9-11s. How, how do you compare them? Well, obvious way to do it is by per capita equivalence. Population of the United States in 2001 was about 30 times the uh, size of the Chilean population in 1973. So by comparison, it would be as if 
9-11-2001 killed 150,000 people, tortured about a million people, overthrew the government, stole a brutal military dictatorship that 50 years later, the country still isn't, hasn't managed to escape. 9-11 was bad enough, but nothing like that. How do we treat the, per the perpetrators? We honor them. That's it. Now take Iraq again. The United States actually commemorated the 20th anniversary of the invasion. How? The US Navy commissioned its latest assault vessel, named it the USS Fallujah. That's named in honor of one of the major atrocities of the Iraq invasion. Uh, invasion, the marine invasion of Fallujah was one of the most beautiful cities of Iraq. It was smashed, destroyed, thousands of people killed, uh, de depleted uranium, white phosphorus are used, they're still suffering from cancer rates. So we commemorate it by uh, commissioning the ship the USS Fallujah. You don't read about that in the US press, but you can read about it in the foreign press, not Europe, but the press in the, in, the, in the South. Here you can read about it in the margins if you can find them. Uh, you can also read the response of Iraqis who are bitterly angry and infuriated by this further humiliation and insult after having practically destroyed the country. Do we say anything about it? No. We talk about the goofy grandpa playing with his grandchildren and what a lovely person he is. So going back to my question, ask yourselves, why are we now asking about whether Putin can get away with some of his crimes. It's horrible, he shouldn't get away with them. But why are we asking that? I can give you a long list of other similar cases. All right, thank you so much, Professor Tomsky. So now we're gonna open it up to the audience Q&A. If you'd like to ask a question, we ask that you line up right here. Keep, uh, keep your question brief and speak clearly into the microphone. And we ask that you make sure it's relevant to topics today. Can you come down here, please, Jeff? Yes. You can speak in an unmuted area. Hey, Professor Chomsky. It's an honor to speak to you. My name is Mohammed. And I have a question for you. You recent, you just now said that America has orchestrated coups around the world. And I think that's a fair claim that superpowers try and do that, interfere with elections even. Do you think, I think one of the main sentiments of uh, Trump is that there was interference with the election. Is that claim, is it possible that interference in an election could happen domestically? Well, you're right that the United States interferes constantly in elections, like overthrowing a parliamentary government, that's interfering with elections in a pretty extreme way. We've done it over and over, mentioned Chile, many other cases. Uh, it's considered perfectly normal. In fact, we take pride in it. The Clinton administration openly, publicly intervened in the Russian election in 1996 to ensure the victory of uh, Clinton's friend, Boris Yeltsin. Not secret, it was public. Took pride in the success and overturn in ensuring that the election went to his favor by massive intervention. So it's considered just normal, it's just like intervention, aggression, uh, massacre, that's just our right. We don't raise any questions about that. Well, what about the so-called Russian interference in the US election? It's been investigated pretty carefully uh, by research institutions, government institutions. Nobody can find any effect. 
nobody can find any detectable effect of Russian actions, whatever they may have been on the electoral outcome. But that's the only one we talk about. Very much like uh, Putin getting away with his crimes. That's the only kind of thing we talk about. So when you were talking about framing in terms of Putin getting away with his crimes, I noticed you made almost an assumption that if US foreign policy decided to act, or merely decided not to act, that the government of Ukraine would eventually give up. And I'm not sure that that is accurate. After all, the government of North Korea, and the government of South Korea have maintained nominal stalemate conflict for a very long time now. What is to say that this could not happen in this case as well? Well, it would be bad, but. A permanent stalemate like Korea? Is that what you're suggesting? Yes, I believe so. It has been proposed. Uh, one well-known military historian, Lawrence Friedman, has suggested that we should try to reach a Korean style settlement in Ukraine. That is a permanent conflict. Uh, well, you can do that if you want, but uh, that would mean that Russia stays where it is. Uh, Ukraine stays with what's left and uh, there's conflict at the borders. Maybe it doesn't escalate. Uh, both countries suffer. And of course, Ukraine suffers far more. Just take a look at the relative scale. Uh, I don't think that's, it, it would be a pretty horrible outcome, but I don't think it's very likely. Uh, the United States, remember that there's two forces here. The world, we don't talk about it here, but outside the United States, there is a world, believe it or not, and they have views, and their view overwhelmingly is that the war in Ukraine is by now a proxy war between the United States and Russia over Ukrainian bodies. Well, you can decide whether you think that's right or not, but I don't think it's an implausible picture. Official US policy, official US policy is that the war must continue to severely weaken Russia. And notice that the United States is getting a bargain out of this. It's so obvious that it's openly discussed in the political class, the, high, the literature in the United States, Britain and elsewhere. Tremendous bargain for a fraction of the US colossal US military budget. The US is able to severely degrade the military forces of its own only real military opponent, Russia. That's a real bargain. Uh, you can ask whether that lies behind US policy or not, but that it's a bargain is not a question. So the US has a policy, continuing the war to severely weaken Russia. That precludes, now we can look seriously at the conflict we have two sides, Russia and the United States. Neither wants to back down or can be forced to back down. Both have the capacity to escalate without limits. There isn't going to be any stalemate. If that policy is pursued, you'll have escalation up to very possibly a terminal nuclear war easy to think of scenarios, many have been discussed. So uh, Putin, with all the atrocities in Ukraine, has not done what the US and Britain did in Iraq. Uh, you recall a couple of weeks ago, Joe Biden, Janet Yellen, other leaders visited Kiev. Try to think back and ask how many leaders visited Baghdad when the US and Britain were smashing it to dust. Not only did nobody visit, but foreigners were forced out. The UN uh, inspectors had to leave. US peace groups that were there had to leave. 
you don't survive U.S. shock and awe. We fight a different kind of war. Go for the jugular, attack, destroy the energy systems, communication, transportation, uh, water supplies, uh, make sure nothing works. No resistance, that's shock and awe, the U.S. style aggression. Nobody goes to visit Baghdad. Well, Putin could escalate to the U.S. style. U.S. analysts have talked about it, military analysts, could start seriously attacking Western Ukraine. So uh, you wouldn't have people visiting Kiev, could attack the supply lines by which uh, through Poland, uh, uh, mater uh, high quality material uh, are coming into Ukraine to attack, uh, to defend Ukraine from the Russian point of view, attack the Russian uh, positions. Suppose they decide to bomb the uh, supply lines. Pretty soon you're getting into conflict with the NATO power. Then what happens? You can say goodbye to each other. The camp, there's a lot of loose talk about limited nuclear war. It's complete nonsense. You get into a nuclear war with a major power, go straight up the escalation ladder, every war game shows that, you're all dead, okay? That's the likely consequences of the effort to impose a stalemate, apart from the brutality of the consequences for Ukraine. You talked about class warfare and the frustration of the public and the frustration of the public building towards institutions. What do you see the future holding as tensions rise and class warfare becomes more pronounced? It's up to you. It does. It is up to you. Question is whether there'll be resistance to it. If only one side is engaged in class war, you know the outcome. If both sides are engaged, it's quite different. Uh, go back to my childhood, the 1930s. Uh, the, the unions, the labor unions, which are the at the fore, have always been at the forefront of struggle for basic rights of working people, poor people. Uh, they had been decimated by the 1920s. Uh, severe state corporate violence had destroyed the vibrant, lively US uh, uh, labor movement. One of the great labor historians, David Montgomery, has a book which you ought to read called The Rise and Fall of the House of Labor. The fall was the 1920s after Woodrow Wilson's Red Scare, largely directed against labor unions. There was almost nothing left. Then came a gilded age in the 1920s, very much like today, huge inequality, enormous wealth, broke down finally in depression, which uh, much worse poverty than anything today. Uh, but there was a reaction. The CIO began to organize mill and labor unions, industrial actions, far reaching ones like sit down strikes, which are a real threat to capital. Sit down strikes as uh, one more move and we'll just take the enterprise over. We don't need you. We can run it ourselves. Well, in that context with a, there were also political parties active, uh, a lot of ferment among the population, sympathetic administration, Roosevelt administration. You got the New Deal policies, which laid the basis for social democratic uh, progress from which we all benefit from today to the extent that they haven't been eviscerated by the Reagan, Clinton, Obama class war. Uh, the uh, uh, social security uh, minimum wage, uh, uh, working, proper working conditions, uh, 
control over the financial institutions. Of course, that disappeared after Reagan. Uh, all of this was uh, happened because uh, the other side engaged in class war. Well, that's where we stand now. Uh, Reagan and Thatcher, take a look, they initiated the neoliberal assault by attacking labor unions. Take a look at the early 80s. Their first move, destroy the labor movement and open the door for corporations to move in with sophisticated strike-breaking measures to undermine what's left of labor. Clinton moved in with his international, uh, uh, what's called the international trade agreements, which uh, further undermine uh, unions. Uh, in fact, most organizing efforts in the United States were uh, about 50% of them were undermined simply by corporations threatening to move the enterprise to Mexico if organizing continued. It's of course illegal, but when you have a criminal state, there's no problem for the corporations to carry out illegal acts. End result, labor movement very seriously harmed, much like the 20s. Can it recover? I think so. Can other social organizations develop and work to try to create a more decent and more just society? No reason why not. It's happened before. So the answer to your question is, it's for you to answer. I can't do it. You can. Uh, this question is this question is sort of of a similar vein to the previous one. As you just said, you know, the, the future is up to our generation, but what can the next generation of the American left do to make sure our acts and words of dissent are heard and given due consideration, especially considering the anti-intellectual nature of the right and the theatrical nature of politics today and the shallow rhetoric that seems so pervasive? Well, let's ask about the anti-intellectual nature of the right. Where's that come from? Well, there are good studies of this. Uh, one scholar who's studied it in some depth is Naomi Oreskes. What's happened is, if you look back, there has been a corporate offensive for decades to try to undermine rationality. That's exactly what it is, and for good reasons. Began with the tobacco companies, lead companies, asbestos companies, through the 1940s, 1950s. Information was coming along showing that what they're doing is slaughtering Americans. Tobacco, lead, asbestos, other poisons, are carrying out a huge massacre of Americans. Well, how did they react to that? Cleverly, not by denying it. If you deny it, you're too quickly refuted, but by casting doubt. How do we know? Is the evidence good enough? Why should we believe these liberal scientists who are just trying to take away your right to smoke or, or, or to buy whatever you want? was picked up by the fossil fuel industries. Uh, the scientists in ExxonMobil and others were way in the lead in investigating the lethal effect of fossil fuels. This is long before it became a major issue, the 50s, 60s, 70s, sending information to the management of ExxonMobil and others that use of fossil fuels is gonna destroy organized human life on earth. Well, it was filed away in drawers by company management until 1988. 1988, James Hansen, famous geophysicist, testified that Congress, widely publicized testimony, broke the whole story open. Fossil fuels are 
going to destroy us. Well, the industry got its PR managers together, decided how to react to this, gave them the same advice. Don't deny it. If you deny it, you're quickly refuted. So doubt. We don't know enough about cloud covers, maybe sunspots. Why should we believe these liberal intellectuals? Uh, you go down to right up to the present, go down to the Mexican border, the last election, uh, oil producing regions, kind of propaganda. This, these are areas that voted Democrat for a hundred years. They finally voted for Trump. Why? Propaganda said, why believe these uh, scientists and liberal liberals who uh, liberal elites who tell you that climate change is taking place and trying to take away your jobs and uh, destroy your communities could come along with me, you know, the fossil fuel companies and their representative Donald Trump. Well, without a counter voice, that worked. If there is a counter voice, it doesn't work. I can give you examples. But that's class war. One effect of this is to help sponsor an environment of opposition to science, anti-intellectualism, a hatred of so-called liberal elites. Notice if you're a criminal, you try to point somewhere else, somewhere somebody else is guilty, not me. So it's not the corporate sector that's guilty, it's the liberal elites, whoever they may be. And they help out by people like Hillary Clinton uh, condemning uh, Trump supporters as deplorables. They love that. Yeah, that's those liberal elites who have contempt for us. At least Trump says, I love you while he's stabbing in the back. Uh, well, all of this joins together to an atmosphere of uh, anti-intellectualism. You see it in many ways. Take the uh, anti-vaccine movement. It's killed hundreds of thousands of Americans. Uh, it's overwhelmingly, you find it in Republican states. Uh, well, it's part of the same thing. Why should we believe anybody? Look what they've done to us. I don't have any reason to believe them. A lot of justice in that feeling. So let's just uh, reject these jabs that these liberal intellectuals are insisting we take. A lot of stories then come along about what it does to you and so on and so forth. That's easy to concoct. It's, across, it's all across the society and it is does support. And let's go back to labor unions again. Labor unions during the period of their vital, vibrant existence, like the 1930s or 1890s and so on, they were not just interested in wage, raising wages and improving working conditions. These were institutions that were a broad cultural society. I might remember my, my own, real, I happen to have my family's all first generation immigrants. They were all working class, mostly unemployed in the thirties, but uh, quite educated. Many of them never had formal education, but they went to adult education courses run by the unions. They had cultural centers that were part of the life of the unions. Uh, left intellectuals in those days, famous ones, would lecture for working groups. Uh, they wanted to be educated, cultivated. Uh, the, um, uh, and this is a barrier against anti-intellectualism. Also ways of getting together to deliberate, think about social and political issues, what we can do about it. It's been very important to try to break all that down, to eliminate social bonds, to atomize people, let them make them alone, facing concentrated power, then they're prey to all of these uh, uh, kinds of attacks. Well, we know how to overcome it. Answer is to do it. And it's being done sometimes in 
pretty impressive ways. I'll take, say, West Virginia coal mining state. There's been significant activism there by groups uh, based mostly at uh, uh, University of Massachusetts and Amherst uh, Political Economy Research Institute, very good economists, friends and colleagues of mine. A lot of them have been working on the ground in West Virginia, working with minor group, miners groups, working out the, basically pointing out what's a basic fact that you can't ignore. Coal mining is just going to disappear. If it doesn't disappear, it'll kill all of us. It'll destroy them, destroy their communities. There is an alternative. They can move to working in sustainable energy, capping mines, better lives, better jobs, better communities. It's been successful enough that the United Mine Workers accepted a transition program from coal to sustainable energy. Same is true of unions in Ohio, extractive industries in California, can be done, but uh, not unless somebody does it. Um, I have a question. So uh, if you're against US intervention in other governments, does the US have the rights to decide for Ukraine's future by calling the peace? Do you realize that Ukrainians at occupied territories are oppressed and tortured every day? I'm saying that because my hometown is occupied right now. And I know of the war crimes that have been committed from the first hand. And um, do you not believe that other conflicts can deteriorate if Russia gets away with what they've done? And uh, in 1994, Ukraine gave up their third nuclear power in the world in the exchange for guarantees from Russia to recognize its sovereignty. And Russia has invaded Ukraine in 2014. They broke out the war in Donetsk. Uh, and uh, we all, US also attempted to negotiate that through the Minsk. Um, however, all the attempts failed. Do you not believe that other peace call will be broken again by Russia? Uh, what you're repeating is the official propaganda line. Now let's look at the facts which you can find out. Let's start with 1994. There was an agreement. Ukraine uh, abandoned its nuclear weapons. Then something happened. After that, uh, Bill Clinton uh, violated the agreement between President Bush number one and Gorbachev, in which Bush number one promised not unambiguously, very clear. You can look at the documents. There's been a lot of deceit about them, but you can find them. National Security Archive on the web. Unambiguous promise that if Gorbachev agreed to let Germany be unified within a hostile military alliance, NATO, quite a concession if you look at history. Agreement was if Gorbachev agreed to that, the United States pledged not to move one inch to the east of Germany. Firm, definite promise. Okay, in that context, Ukraine, part of Russian Federation, gave up its nuclear weapons. Okay, then Clinton violated. Very soon moved to incorporate east former U Russian satellites up to the Russian border within NATO. We think of NATO as defensive. The world knows differently. It's an aggressive, violent military alliance. That's very clear from its record. Uh, so it moved NATO up to the Russian border, stalled heavy weapons on the Russian border. Uh, at that point, the Ukrainian, the Russian decision to allow Ukraine to give up nuclear weapons, the whole story was abrogated. Well, what happened then? For the last 
30 years, the almost the entire high level US diplomatic corps, including current CIA director, William Burns, his predecessors, George Bush's the second uh, Secretary of Defense, hawkish Robert Gates, uh, Reagan's ambassador to Russia, Jack Matlock, George Kennan, famously, just about anyone who knew anything about Russia was harsh, I mean, practically the whole uh, US political class, right to left, including hawks like Paul Nitze, have been warning the United States government that it's reckless and provocative to violate the commitment not to extend, extend NATO to the Russian border and particularly dangerous to violate what all Russian leaders have called the red lines, Yeltsin, Gorbachev, Putin, Medvedev, all of them, Ukraine and Georgia, which are right at the core of the Russian heartland, uh, not to violate that by demanding that they be part of an aggressive military alliance. Well, let's take 2014 and it got worse. Wish the second Bush uh, dismantled the ABM treaty. It's a very serious threat to Russia that puts uh, major weapons on the Russian border aimed at Russia. Remember, the United States has tactical nuclear weapons aimed at Russia a couple of miles from its uh, heartland. ABM treaty expanded, the, dismantling the treaty expanded that. And go into the details. Uh, Bush too also offered, to, uh, invited Ukraine to join NATO. Well, that was vetoed by France and Britain, France and Germany, but uh, uh, US power overwhelmed it, so it stayed on the agenda. Everyone understood the whole high level US diplomatic corps that this is something no Russian leader would ever accept the Ukraine as part of a hostile military alliance. You look at history, look at the topography, open plain right to Moscow, St. Petersburg. No Russian leader is ever going to accept that. Well, then comes the Don, the 2014, what's described in the United States the way you described it. But what actually happened happens to be rather different. Sorry if you don't want to listen to it, maybe others do. What happened is that there was an elected president of Ukraine, uh, Yevchenko. He was overthrown in a coup backed by the United States. Okay. You can say, I like the coup. I didn't like the coup. It doesn't matter, but it is a coup of a coup which overthrew the elected president uh, who was more or less sympathetic to Russia, replaced him by a, he, he called for, he said, let's have another election. Coup leaders rejected that. There's a lot of violence, mostly from the coup leaders. If you look at it, uh, the, uh, uh, the new government that was installed banned the Russian language, uh, took militant anti-Russian positions in the Donbass region. Uh, most of the population is Russia-oriented. They objected. They didn't want to be part of it. There was a proposal, an international proposal, the Minsk agreements. Uh, these are not, it was uh, mainly led by France and Germany, Russia and Ukraine, but it was an international agreement. UN Security Council voted unanimously for it, including the United States. That's the Minsk agreements. Uh, Ukraine maybe tried to observe them. The US was opposed to it uh, and didn't get anywhere. Zelensky, when he was elected, tried to move in that direction, was threatened by white wing forces. US wouldn't back him, he backed off. The, uh, up until a few weeks before the invasion, February, 2022, 
Russia was calling for implementation of the Minsk agreements, which called for Ukrainian neutrality, not part of uh, not part of NATO, kind of like Austria during the Cold War, actually kind of like Mexico today. Mexico can't join a hostile military alliance. If it tried, we'd blow it away. Okay, so it's neutral. So Ukraine would be like that. The Donbass region, Eastern Ukraine, would have a degree of autonomy within a Ukrainian federation, something like Switzerland or Belgium. Up until a couple of weeks before the invasion, the Putin government was still proposing that. US is not having it. Ukraine, I think under US influence, rejected it. Uh, then you get the invasion. Does it justify the invasion? No, it's an act of criminal aggression. It's a crime, as I've said over and over, rather like the US invasion of Iraq, though nowhere near as serious. Uh, the Stalin Hitler invasion of Poland, these are acts of aggression. It doesn't, whatever provocation there may be, it doesn't justify them. But we can't ignore the record of what happened up until the invasion. Well, even after the invasion, there were negotiations. Uh, last March and April, there were negotiations between Russia and Ukraine under Turkish auspices. According to Turkish sources, they were getting somewhere. The Prime Minister of Britain, Boris Johnson, flew to Kiev, informed Zelensky's government that the US and Britain were thought this is not a good time for negotiations, we're opposed to it. He was followed by Lloyd Austin, the US Secretary of Defense. The media aren't interested in these things, so nothing's reported. We know about it mostly from Ukrainian sources. But presumably, Austin gave his usual message public. No end to the war unless we severely weaken Russia. In any event, the, the negotiations broke down. Well, is there a possibility of negotiations now? Only one way to find out. Try. If you're opposed to trying, of course, there's nothing. Well, that's not the whole story. There's much more. But uh, on both sides, plenty of things to say. But I think that's a pretty accurate broad brush account. And you have to consider that when you ask the kinds of questions that are being asked about Russian crimes and, and terror, which is certainly real. It's a horror story, undoubtedly. The longer the war goes on, the more it'll get worse. And notice it's not just Ukraine that's suffering. Ukraine has probably by now lost most of its army. It's now fighting with reserves, uh, newly recruited, uh, uh, newly recruited soldiers. Uh, the U.S. the Pentagon has conceded that U.S. the U.S. is directing the advanced equipment that's being used, high Mars and so on, all leading to the possibility that Russia may escalate to the U.S. style of war, Iraq style, shock and awe type war. Uh, meanwhile, the, there's plenty of others suffering from this. There's a good reason why virtually the entire global south, that's most of the world, is calling for a negotiated settlement. Good reason why the majority of the population in Germany, population, not the political class, population, large majorities saying we have to move towards a negotiated settlement. There's a lot of people suffering from this. In the global south, people are suffering seriously from the deterioration of uh, grain and fertilizer exports from the Black Sea region. It's causing massive starvation. Uh, one of the, there is the constant threat of escalation to major nuclear war, probably the worst effect is that the continuation of the war has reversed the limited steps that had been taken, were being taken to try to deal with the 
heating of the environment, which is going to destroy us and not in the distant future. Reverse these efforts. Now there's opening up new uh, regions for oil exploration for generations ahead in the United States and Qatar and Saudi Arabia, huge profits for the fossil fuel companies, for the munitions companies, they love it, on racing on to destruction. All of this happens as long as the war continues. There are good reasons why the major, large majority of the population of the world is calling for moves to try to settle it before it gets worse. Okay, you can think about it. And if you want to look at the history, which you should look at it act accurately, not just what you hear from US propaganda. There's plenty of documentation about it. Professor Chomsky, I know it's been over an hour. Would you still be good to answer one more question? Sure. All right, Brian. Thank you, Professor. Um, with regard to nuclear proliferation, um, the fascist uh, tactics of the NRA and um, leftist revolution, um, is the threat of violence the only mechanism that we have to either establish peace or um, progressive revolution? Well, notice that a question is begged by the way that's formulated. Would violence help overcome these problems? No reason to believe that. Resort to violence is moving into the arena where the enemy has the power. If you're a tactician, you don't move into the arena where the opponent is powerful. You move into the arena where the opponent is weak. Uh, the opponent in this case has overwhelming power. Any kind of violence that the left could muster would be a, a, a P in a, a, in a haystack. So to use violence, say, let's give the opponent all the advantages that they desire. You can see it happening when uh, uh, groups uh, during, say, the Black Lives Matter, uh, the Floyd, uh, after the George Floyd murder, after the the big demonstrations, the leadership of the Black Lives Matter movement tried very hard to keep it completely nonviolent. But there was a fringe, maybe provocateurs, we don't know, who were breaking into stores, looting, throwing stones at the police and so on. Right wing loved it. They ran with it. Now there's a fancy story you can hear on Fox News all the time about how it's these violent leftists who are responsible for everything. They love it. So the first part of the question is, I think a question is begged, which is wrong. I should say that revolutionaries have always understood this. But take the Vietnamese. You look back over the Vietnam War, Back as far as the year, we have a rich record of that. US intelligence understood very well from the early 60s when Kennedy escalated the war that the United States is fighting a military war and the Vietnamese resistance is fighting a political war. They're gaining power and control in villages by policies they're carrying out only way the United States has to react is by violence. And in fact, that was the way the war was fought. It was a violent war by the aggressor state, a political war by the resistance. Later, the United States succeeded in turning it into a war against North Vietnam. Then it became a military war. But the main target of the US attack was always South Vietnam. 80% of the population peasant were the main target, and they were fighting a political war. Actually, the same is happening on the international sphere right now. Take China. The United States is ringing China with uh, what are called sentinel states. The term is encirclement, official term of the Biden administration. Encircle China with sentinel states 
armed with uh, precision weapons aimed at China, provided by the United States, South Korea, Japan, Australia, the US islands like Guam, uh, and also carry out a commercial war against China to try to prevent it from developing for a generation by withholding uh, high technology equipment and coercing others into not providing it. Well, that's the US style. We go to war. What's China doing? Not this. What China's doing is things like the uh, recent initiative in the Middle East, which uh, China based initiative, which brought together Iran and Saudi Arabia, bitter enemies who had been at each other's throats for decades, brought them together, accommodation, exchanging foreign ministers, moving on towards closer relations, might end the proxy war in Yemen, which has been the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. It's a real achievement. How does the United States react? Great hostility, understandably. This throws a wrench in long-standing US policies of controlling the oil producing regions and in recent years creating an anti-Iran alliance. This is undermining it. Well, that's it's called in international affairs literature, soft power, diplomacy, investment, trade relations, political war, political organization, the other side, force and violence. Now, if you go back to your question, I think the same thing arises. If you want to deal with the situation domestically, it's not going to be through violence. That's giving a gift to the enemy. It's going to be through organization, activism. What was done with the West Virginia miners, for, to take one example, i give you many others. No, that's the way you go forward. That's the way you build up public support, understanding, uh, activism, which can lead to change in very positive directions. It's happened in the past. It's nothing new. Mm. The United States people will look back into history, but don't go back far. Go, go back 50 years. Take a look at what the United States was like in the 1950s, 1960s. Okay, take a look. Uh, 1960s, the United States had anti-miscegenation laws, which were so severe that the Nazis refused to accept them. The one drop of blood law. Nazis refused to accept that it was too harsh for them. There was federal supported housing, but it was segregated by law, no blacks. That meant that uh, during the growth period of the 50s and 60s, uh, black but he couldn't buy a house. In the United States, for most people, wealth is your property. Blacks couldn't get into the that system. It's one reason why there's such an enormous wealth gap today. Federally, federal law required segregation, not because the liberals in Congress wanted that, because that was the only way to get any legislation through the racist uh, Southern Democrat opposition. Uh, take the rights, take women. You go back to the founding fathers, you can read these things and the uh, decisions made by justices like Alito and uh, Thomas today. We got to look at the founding fathers and the tradition. Uh, recently, you may recall the Supreme Court, Thomas's ruling rejected a law which uh, uh, said that some man couldn't have guns because he was guilty of domestic abuse. They overthrew that. And Thomas's decision said, we have to be look at the history. And there's nothing in history that says there's anything against domestic abuse, which is quite true. There was no domestic abuse in the, the found for the founding fathers, no such thing. They took over British common law, 
British common law, William, women are not persons, they're property. A woman is the property of her husband, her father, father hands it over to the husband. If the husband wants to beat his property, there's no, no problem with that. So all through the history, there's no real basis for arguing that there should be any kind of women's rights. Well, that's actually true, but it changed in the 60s through popular activism. Young women got together, consciousness in groups saying, I'm not gonna take this anymore. Finally led to a large scale movement. Finally, even the Supreme Court came along. 1975, for the first time, Supreme Court decided that women are persons with the rights of what are called peers. The case had to do with service on a federal jury. Women for the first time had the right to serve on a federal jury as peers, that is as people, not property. Well, that was the United States in the 50s and the 60s. It's very different today, not by magic, but not by violence, by active organization and activism. Many other cases, that's the way progress can be made. And it can be. And now it's more urgent than ever when you're facing things like a climate crisis, which is truly existential. We don't deal with it, we're basically finished. Well, it's young people who are organizing to try to do something. You take a look at the uh, international meetings, the COP meetings. What you find is basically two meetings, like Glasgow, go back to that. There were the meetings in the halls, you know, well-dressed ladies and gentlemen talking to each other, doing nothing. Then there was what was going on in the streets. Tens of thousands of people, mostly young people, demonstrating, demanding that those wealthy guys in the fancy halls address the, the destruction of the climate that is going to terminate livable conditions for the generation of the young people out there demonstrating. That can make a difference, just like it has in the past already has made a difference. That's why there's at least some moves to do something. But it's a constant battle. You give up, you lose. All right, can we get a round of applause for Professor Chomsky? Thank you. We just want to thank you so much for being generous, generous with your time and spending it with the Douglas Dialogues and the EI community in general. We're extremely grateful. And um, thank you all for coming at the event. Really, really amazing turnout and really nice to see new faces. And um, Declan and I will be around here if you want to learn more about the event and learn about uh, new events. But other than that, uh, have a wonderful rest of your night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor. We'll be in touch. Thank you. We'll be in touch. Please do.